Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back into the studio. Today we're going to begin the mold making process on the half-life size sculpture that we made in our Patreon exclusive series, which you can see on my Patreon page. The entire process I go through is geared towards ending up with a hard copy of this clay sculpture in a different material, a hard material other than clay. Now this can be plaster, resin or bronze or anything really that's hard. In order to facilitate that, we need to make a mold of the sculpture that we can cast our hard copy in. The first stage we must tackle is the silicone stage. Let's start off by talking about the tools and materials that I'll be using during that process. As you can see here, the materials are pretty mundane and you don't need a lot. Most of it will be self-explanatory as we progress through and I'll touch on each at that particular time. The most important on here, obviously, is the silicone and the catalyzer. And the silicone we'll be using is a paste silicone, and I get a lot of questions about this material. The silicone is called BlueSil RTV 3325P, and I'll include links from two places where you can purchase this kind of silicone in the text description below the video. The reason I use this silicone is not speed, not because it's the highest quality material either. It's super simple, easy to use, and it gets the job done, and it's fairly cheap as well. The mixing of this silicone with its catalyzer is extremely straightforward. Per 5 kilo bucket comes 5 tubes of catalyzer, so 1 tube of catalyzer per 1 kilo of material. You can certainly mix it this way if you want to, but one of the great things about this silicone is how flexible it is when it comes to the mixing ratio. So I just mix it by eye and use the color of the material to judge whether I've mixed in enough catalyzer. As long as you mix in some catalyzer and the two components are thoroughly mixed, you should be good to go. And you can check whether you're thoroughly mixed or not by looking for colored yellow streaks in your mixed or not mixed well enough silicone. You'll notice that I use no gloves in this video and the reason for that is because this silicone sticks like crazy to the gloves, which makes it very annoying to handle. You can help deal with this by using a little bit of sunflower seed oil on your gloves it's probably the approach I would recommend to most people instead of doing what I'm doing here, which is working without any gloves. You should also notice that while I'm mixing, I mix the material by folding the catalyzer into the silicone and I never let the catalyzer itself touch my hands. I was told at some point that the toxic part of this mix is the catalyzer and so I keep that away from me. Now, am I 100% sure that that's true? No, not really. So. You should probably wear gloves and not be like me, just in case. We use this silicone at school because the chance of catastrophic failure is slim when working with this kind of silicone and new students who have never cast anything before. There's basically no mess compared to liquid silicone, which I know you can work clean with, but it can also turn into a giant disaster real quick. So I've kind of just stuck with this silicone for the reasons described above. Ease of use, reliable, simple, little to no mess. And these are all qualities that I appreciate when attempting to make a mold. With the silicone mixed, we are ready to go and begin applying it to the figure. I keep the silicone in a little container of water and make sure that my hands are moist with water when I touch the silicone, as this keeps it from sticking to my hand. And as I said, this stuff is very sticky. It will stick to my hands if I don't use water, so I always keep my hands wet. The clay has been allowed to firm up for 5 to 10 minutes or so at this point, because we are applying the silicone by hand. And if the clay is a little firm, it means there's less chance of us denting the sculpture as we work. We don't want to work on wet clay here. The application is easy and straightforward. I put a small piece on and squeeze it outwards, working out air bubbles as I go. The thickness for this first layer should be very thin in order to avoid causing air bubbles. Any bubbles will show up on the surface of our casting, because this first layer captures the, the surface of our clay sculpture. I like to have this layer so thin that I can almost see through it. I can see the color of the clay through the silicone. The thicker the layer is, the softer the silicone will seem under your fingers, so you can almost judge the thickness of your silicone layer by touch or feel. This takes a bit of practice to get used to, of course, but it is something that you do get used to very quickly. 
In total, we will end up doing three layers of silicone. As new pieces of silicone are added, I always overlap the edges a little bit as I apply so I can always push and squeeze the silicone away from the leading edge. This keeps the air bubbles being pushed away and out, not back into the previously applied blob of silicone. I always work from the first piece of material outwards. So once a piece is applied, this is my starting point and I always progress outwards from there. Of course, there does come a time when this falls apart a little bit, right at the end usually. But for the most part, I try to stick with this in order to keep pushing those air bubbles outwards towards the edge of my silicone, the leading edge of my silicone. Remember that I said the silicone is sticky, so I keep it in water the whole time? This, of course, means that the silicone is wet when I apply it to my sculpture. It has water on it. And one of the things I don't want, one of the things I want to avoid is my clay becoming soft with water, which makes it very easy for an impression from my fingers to be transferred to the, to the clay surface as I work. I try to always keep silicone in between my fingers and the clay in order to help avoid this, but I also work from the bottom of my sculpture upwards towards the top. And the reason for this is so that all the water from the silicone always runs down the sculpture onto already applied silicone, not onto clay that I'm later going to touch. If I work from the top down, the clay further down the figure will become soaked and soft as I apply silicone to the upper portion and then potentially damaged when I get to it because it's too soft at that point. Working from the bottom heading upwards seems to be the least risky option to me, so that's what I do. In some fragile or sensitive areas like the hands, for example, I'll take advantage of having the material between my fingers and the clay. I can use a slightly thicker piece of silicone than normal and squeeze it into hard to reach areas, letting the material overflow in between the fingers, for example, without actually having to stick my own finger in there or use a small tool. I use this technique when trying to get silicone into cracks and creases, for example, into the buttocks, between the buttocks or where the arm touches the body. And it works really, really well. The supporting pole coming out of the figure's buttocks have to be incorporated into the mold and it's pretty simple to do so. The mold will split in half, in an upper and a lower half, right at this pole, so it won't get locked into the mold. Having said that, figuring out how to take this apart, how to part the mold, is not something that I'm going to think a lot about until all three layers of silicone have been applied. We'll deal with parting the mold next time we work on this mold, in the next video of this series. For now, we will just make sure that a little part of the pole is covered in silicone. We will eventually want silicone between the hard mother mold and the hard pole to facilitate the molding, gives it a little bit of flex. And so we might as well start right here with a little bit of silicone, even though this stage is really meant to capture all the details of the surface of our clay. Let's take a quick second to talk about how you can support a channel. Subscribing and liking the video is of great help, of course, but if you would like to get something in return for your support, head over to my Patreon page. On Patreon, you can watch exclusive content like the Beginner's Guide to Figure Sculpture, which we just completed, and very soon, the Portrait Series, which will begin next week, where I will show you everything you will need to know about sculpting portraiture. You can also get personal feedback on your own work from me on anything you might need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out. There's a link in the description below. Sometimes you do have to use a tool, and when I do, I prefer to use a wooden tool, the very same tool that I would use for sculpting, except this time it's been dipped in water so it doesn't stick to the silicone. You can't fit your fingers everywhere, no matter the size of the sculpture or your fingers, so a tool comes in very handy from time to time. I suppose you could actually use the tool a lot more than what I do when you apply the silicone, Potentially the whole time, actually. So if you hate working with gloves and don't want silicone on your hands, this might be a route 
worth pursuing. It'll probably take a little bit longer than what I'm doing here though. The final spot to apply silicone to is the head. I like to leave the head for last as it's kind of fun to see the most human part of the sculpture disappear last. And it's nice to leave yourself with something nice to look at as the work does get very boring and tedious at times. I used the technique of squeezing slightly too large pieces of silicone on the face all the time because there's no way I'm getting anywhere near the tiny details of this face with my fingers. I don't want to ruin anything. Damaging something now would be very lame. Working with freshly mixed material as well helps when working on detailed areas like the face because the fresh mix of silicone is much softer. Depending on the amount you mix up, you might find yourself in a situation where the material is starting to firm up a bit before you have applied it all. If that happens, you should apply the silicone to an area that's open and flat without too much detail. Like, a, like the base, for example. Which ultimately doesn't matter as much as the surface of the clay sculpture, of the human figure of the sculpture. Once the small and intricate details are covered, the rest of the head is straightforward and much like the rest of the application. And that is the first layer finished. This is the layer where you need to take the most time and care as it is the layer where all these sculpted details should be captured. Everything you've put effort into making in clay should get captured in this layer. Hopefully with minimal air bubbles, so there will be little to no retouching to do in whatever hard material you end up casting this piece in. Once this process starts, I wouldn't wait too long in between the layers because I've seen there be some issue with bonding between layers when you wait for a long period of time between application. I waited a day here before applying both the second and the third layer in the same day with a lunch break in between to let the silicone set up. There's very little to be said about the second and third layers, which is why there will only be time lapses of them here. You want to make the second and third layer quite a bit thicker than the first and end up with a final thickness around five or six millimeters to one centimeter. If the piece is smaller, you can get away with a thinner silicone skin. And if it's larger, the silicone should be a little bit thicker to make sure it doesn't rip under its own weight. The only real thing to carefully consider here is the thickness, of course, and also that the third layer of silicone needs to be smooth, or at least as smooth as you can possibly make it. You'll notice that the difference from the level of smoothness on the second layer to the third layer is going to be quite great. And the reason for this is registration. On top of the third layer of silicone goes the mother mold, and we want the two to release from each other without any issues. Silicone also has the potential to shrink a little bit, and so if there is a ton of texture on the silicone and inside our mother mold, and the silicone shrinks, the texture on the silicone and its negative counterpart inside the mother mold won't line up any longer, giving us potential for misregistration or bumps that we didn't intend, and a mold that no longer produces accurate castings of our original. So to avoid this issue completely, I give my silicone a fairly smooth surface, which you can just do by rubbing your fingers over the silicone uh, with water on your fingers. Pretty easy to do. Smooth also means that there are less places for the silicone to snag and begin ripping apart. So all in all, smooth is better. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.